Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this episode, we're going to continue our analysis of the Cellmate Secrets documentary that aired on Friday. And we're really going to play a little game called Spot the Difference. You know, what is wrong with this picture? And so at about 25 minutes, 31 seconds into the almost 42 minute documentary, we see Cheryl and Cadle basically talking about the driveway section. Basically, she's going through the events that played out early in the morning of 13th August 2018. Now, I often find these Lifetime movies and documentaries interesting not so much for what they get right, but being able to identify what they get wrong and and knowing why. So in other words, it's a test of your attention to detail uh, in terms of their lack of attention to detail, if that makes sense. So in this episode, we're going to focus on just the dramatization showing Chris Watts leaving the garage in the Lifetime documentary and then what is wrong with it and why and we're going to juxtapose that with the actual footage from Nathaniel Trinasic's CCTV um, camera and I'm going to be playing that a couple of times. After this look out for the next episode in the Shakedown blogs where we'll be dealing with the day that Shanann announced to Chris Watts that she was pregnant. Incidentally if you'd like me to do some analysis on the Chris Watts movie, the Lifetime movie. Um, I can do that as well. Just let me know. And so if you're interested in this sort of analysis, if you're interested in the Chris Watts case, if you're interested in high-profile true crime uh, coverage and footage, then this is probably the channel for you. I've written a number of books on high-profile cases. So if you're interested in that, please subscribe to this channel, like, share, leave a comment. And let's get started. So as I mentioned earlier, the point of this episode is to play a little game called Spot the Difference. And we're going to focus on footage from uh, Cellmate Secrets. I think it's the fourth episode in the series. Specifically the um, dramatization at about 26 minutes where you see it's kind of faded out. It's kind of out of focus and you see... Um, someone representing Chris Watts coming out of the garage and he's carrying something and he's obviously loading it into his truck, right? And so I want to give you the opportunity. So before I go any further, I want you to give you the opportunity to look at the these images from the documentary and leave a comment saying what you notice is wrong with 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 the representation, right? What do you see that that is is off and and not correct, right? So, please don't look at the other comments. Try and just use your own um, ability to uh, you know pick up details and discernment and your knowledge of the case, and then and then we'll compare notes. Okay, so I'm going to give you a moment just to study these images from Cellmate Secrets. So do you spot the difference? So first of all, what I think is pretty obvious is that if we go from the top of the, let's say the image to the bottom, you can see Chris Watts is wearing a grayish shirt And I think what the producers have assumed is that the shirt that you see Chris Watts wearing when he arrives back from the well site is the shirt that he was wearing on the driveway. And of course, we know that that's not the case. They do get the jeans right, but of course he was wearing jeans when he got back, although I think he changed those as well. You can't see it very clearly from the sort of fuzzy image, but Chris Watts is wearing shoes in the cellmate's uh, dramatization. And those shoes are, uh, when you see another close-up image, they're actually white. It's sort of a, a, they look like sneakers. When you zoom in on the image where you sort of see shadows under the truck, um, it actually looks like his shoes are sort of a, a pinkish maroon color. 
and it's only the soles that are white underneath, right? And you might say, well, so what? So what about the color of the shoes or whatever? Well, it turns out to be a really important detail. And it's in this area where there are quite a lot of conspiracy theories saying that, you know, the one person coming out is, is, has got white shoes in the original footage, whereas you can see Chris Watts is wearing boots in, in other footage. And so there were more, this, because the, of the footwear being different, there had to be more than one person. And of course, everything else is the same. The jeans are the same and the, um, you know, the shirt that he's wearing is also the same. And of course, you never see two individuals at the same time, right? I think the other thing that's important to stress is I don't think that Chris Watts carried Shanann out like that. I don't think she was so obviously wrapped in two garbage bags or three garbage bags. Um, I don't think that he carried her the way that that's being depicted. I think it was more likely that she was dragged on the ground across the driveway. I think he would have been hunched over. I don't think he would want to be walking in a vertical way like that, given that there's a camera directed his way um, over his right shoulder. So I just don't think that that dramatization, not only the clothing he's wearing in terms of his shirt and shoes, but also the way he's carrying Shanann and how she's wrapped, I don't think that's accurate either. I think it's more likely she was wrapped in a... Um, uh, the bed sheet. We know that she was wrapped in the bed sheet, and um, it's possible that there were garbage bags on one end or the other end of her body when he carried her out. Although not necessarily, um, it's possible. And there is a, a, a sign. There is an indication on the actual bed sheet that that the sheet was damaged by dragging, because you can see quite. Um, heavy impressions of what looks like gravel or or something that has been a heavy weight is pressed against the sheet causing kind of stretch marks and impressions in the sheet. So if you think about it, there are quite a few things wrong with that dramatization. The clothing is wearing, the footwear is wearing, and the way he's carrying Shanann, that's three. And then the fourth thing um, there's no kind of representational acknowledgement of the sheet. I really don't think she was entirely wrapped in garbage bags. So now we're going to look at some of the original footage. And what I want you to focus on is Chris Watts's footwear. So there you see him step in front of the tire, turns around, steps back, and you can clearly see he's wearing white sneakers, right? When I've taken screen grabs of that, there you can also see white sneakers. When I've taken screen grabs of that, it's um, not as clear as when you actually see him moving, right? So the point to stress here is that you have a scenario of him wearing or somebody wearing white sneakers. It clearly looks like Chris Watts in the beginning, right? Um, I'm talking about where he's walking to and fro with the gas can. And then right at the end, you actually see um, him exiting the scene before he gets into the truck and leaves, then he's wearing boots, right? And and so now I'm going to play you a clip from the discovery. It's the very last clip of several where you see Chris Watts moves the vehicle forward, walks back to the garage, and then later uh, walks back to the vehicle again and then drives off, right? So in the footage, you can actually see the lights are on, there he drives the car forward, then there's a pause and we're going to see him walk back. Now pay attention to the footwear that he's wearing. Can you see it's clearly black boots, right? We're going to see him walk back in the same direction and then he's going to drive off and, um, you know, from there he's heading to the well site. There he is and you can once again see he's wearing black boots. Now I've seen some videos on YouTube where the suggestion is being made that, that um, one of the individuals on the driveway is Nicole Kessinger, and this about gait, and this about the color of the footwear, whatever. And um, it's got some very ominous music in the background. And um, it's, it's just, and I think this particular video that I'm referring to has been viewed almost half a million times, but well over 400,000 times. And um, it's just absolutely... 
um, it's something that doesn't belong in true crime. And so this is the antidote to that kind of conspiracy. We actually had something similar with Ronnie Watts where people were suggesting uh, in one tiny little piece of of the uh, video from Tenacious's video, if you took it out of context, then you could, couldn't see the person's face, but you could see their shoes. And so very early on, people were saying that was Ronnie Watts because Ronnie Watts wore white shoes at the sentencing hearing. Well, actually, they weren't white. They were sort of a grayish color, again, with white soles, right? And probably if you try to find those particular videos now, you wouldn't find them because it is defamatory to put something like that up, to make false accusations. So how do we explain this change in footwear and so on? And for those of you who insist that this is Chris Watts' mistress, now is probably a good time to turn this video off and head to another channel. Right? I'll give you guys a, a moment to do that. Great. Okay. So the for those of you who are curious about this, if you have all of the video clips from the discovery, I'm talking about of Nathaniel to Nastich's from his camera. So in other words, you've got all of those video clips and you can watch them from the beginning to the end chronologically and unedited and just watch them from the beginning to the end. If you can do that, then you see you can you can see exactly what is happening. Um, and it's, it's quite obvious what is happening and a clear way to sort of tell the difference between one screen grab and another is gradually in the background, you can see it growing lighter, you know, uh, the day is dawning. And so when Chris Watts starts to the whole process of, you know, he walks out the garage, goes to his vehicle, turns it on, um, drives slightly past the driveway, then backs it up. Um, all of that is kind of in total darkness. You know, it's at around about 18 minutes past five. But um, half an hour later, it is lightened up considerably. And so there's a difference in lighting between when Chris Watts exits the garage in white sneakers and when he exits the garage at the, uh, you know, the last time wearing the boots and you know, heading to the truck and then driving off. And so um, you've kind of got to ask the question, if that has been Chris Watts all along, what is going on here? Why is he wearing sneakers at one point and then work boots later on? And I think the answer is kind of obvious. The answer is po possibly... On the one hand, he knows whatever he's wearing is going to be contaminated. So he's wearing clothing that he means to dispose of. And that's something that we covered in a letter and, and also we know is true. We know that he dropped it off at the Black Mesa site and I think threw it into a dumpster. But one of the items of clothing I think that he was wearing that he knew he was going to dispose of were his sneakers. And I think he was wearing the sneakers when he was carrying... Um, Shanann at least right and that at least is correctly portrayed in the uh, documentary although they don't seem to be the right color they look almost like white sneakers right then when he gets later into the um, effort or the into the morning probably because of issues such as comfort but also evidence um you know, and speed, he can move quicker wearing his sneakers than in boots. He's got ease of movement. Possibly he can also move more quietly over the driveway in sneakers than in boots. Boots might make kind of a scraping clop clop noise kind of thing. In any event, uh, once he's done most of the, the hard work, then he probably changes his footwear out of sight in the the house of the garage and then he puts on the boots and this is his workwear and so the last thing he sort of does is he puts on the boots once he's finished all of the uh, crime related um, work and then from then he drives to the work site and then he probably is going to try and make sure that he doesn't get anything on his boots and that's possibly why he takes the boots off at the work site He's being very careful not to get any evidence on his clothing. Does that make sense? 
So just to run through that again and just kind of make a sort of a make it simpler. Um, in the beginning, he comes out in his sneakers, goes to the truck, reverses in, and does quite a lot of activity in his sneakers, including where he unloads the or, and sort of loads and unloads the gas can, where he's very close and it's very obvious to see uh, on the Trinastic side of the pickup truck. And then t- towards the end, so in other words, just before he leaves, he then changes his footwear puts on the um, the boots and probably takes the sneakers with him to throw away with the rest of his clothing, which he'll remove once he's finished, I think, burying the bodies and all that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Just another thing I wanted to highlight from the Cellmate Secrets special featuring Chris Watts is where Sherilyn Cadle says something about Chris Watts had no defensive wounds. And there was no sign that she fought back at all. And that's an audio clip from Soulmate Secrets where Shilin Cadle is describing the events that morning. And do you think that's true, that, that there was absolutely no evidence that Shanann fought back? Well, what about the scratch on his neck? I'd, I, I wouldn't say there's no evidence, just that there's almost no evidence or uh, very little evidence, certainly less evidence than you'd expect. But I wouldn't say there's no evidence. I think it's possible that that mark on his neck is a contusion from being scratched by a fingernail. I've heard people saying she didn't have strong enough fingernails to inflict a wound like that. Um, You can argue against that and then say, well, that wound is irrelevant. But I do think there's there's some uncertainty around that. And that is a very fresh wound on his neck either way. His explanation is that it was a mosquito bite. Do you think it's a mosquito bite? I don't. One thing about the driveway footage is, to me, it's actually very chaotic. And maybe it's so chaotic because one or two of the children are still awake and he's sort of got to do something outside, then go back inside and make sure that they're okay and and sort of that they're not going to come outside or whatever and then come outside again. In other words, it's because he's sort of doing two things at the same time that it is he's making such a mess. In the dramatization, as I say, they they, um, depict Shanann as totally closed up in garbage bags. But, you know, if he used two garbage bags, that wouldn't be enough to cover her completely. Um, I don't think Um, you would probably have a section in the middle that would be open. Remember, you can't close the garbage bags, right? In the version of events you're getting from Cadle, where she says, you know, she spoke to him directly and he said he felt nothing, you get a totally different take on that in the um, version that he gives to uh, Coda, Lee, and um, Baumhover in Dodge Correctional in February, where almost throughout the time that he's talking about this this particular part of the story, this incident, he sounds like he's crying. You know, he says, those are my girls, and, and he, he sounds like he's, quite a few times, he doesn't seem to want to talk about it, and Coda sort of pushes him. But it doesn't sound like he didn't feel anything. And, you know, he says he'll remember those words, Daddy, no, for the rest of his life. So, you know, you kind of get a different story from Cadle. Um, and what I think is interesting about the cellmate secrets version of events is although it was covered in the media and I'll provide a couple of, um, some of the headlines, you know, it is in Fox news and it's in meow and it's in this and that, but not a single, um, sort of recognizable mainstream media outlet that some people would consider to be, uh, you know, I know how a lot of people think. Um, if I agree with it, it's 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 good news or it's it's genuine. And if I don't, it's fake news. So I'm sure what was on that channel is real. In any event, um, no no sort of self-respecting news agency actually covered this shocking um, expose. You, you didn't see it on CNN. You didn't see it in the New York Times. You didn't see it in the Telegraph. You didn't see it in sort of BBC News or just sort of any mainstream media that would normally be interested in something where, you know, there's been some kind of revelation. 
So I'm, I'm just going to juxtapose again Sherilyn Cadle's words where she says, you know, he felt nothing. And then what, what says when he's in Dodge prison? And although I think there's some truth that he probably did feel numb and that he probably did um, feel, um, you know, lacking in empathy, I, I don't know if it's true to say that he felt absolutely nothing. What do you think? Well, have a listen. He felt nothing for them at all. So that's a quote from the 27 minute, 15 second mark of Soulmate Secrets on Lifetime. And now we're going to play something from a couple of years earlier in Dodge Correctional when he was talking to Coda, Lee and Bormover. How does she sound when she has to get So that, that soft voice she always had. Yeah. And what exactly did she say? Yeah, it's like it's the same thing that happened to me, Cece, and then I said, I don't even remember what I said. Okay. I don't know if I just said yes, like a horrible person, or if I just put, the sh put that blanket over her too and did the same thing. Same blanket, same way? Mm-hmm. Okay. She said no, Daddy, and that's the last thing she said. <laughs> 